Meanwhile, at the hidden northern branch of the series Merchant Guild, as everything is engulfed in flames, Evelyn fights off the last guy left. Remington realizes this is where they were hiding, just as the MC said. Remy and Evelyn find something after destroying the place. At the trial, Ed's eyes light up with joy as he sees the Troyvan Camellia Palace is now finished. As the MC stands before all the important figures, Wolfgang questions if he wants to take an issue that can be easily resolved if he waits three months into a war. Wolfgang calls it arrogance and questions if our boy is confident he can face the forces of 15 clans alone. Theo says that this is something he needs to handle. Since, in their case, the difference in power is huge, he thinks appeals through proxy battles are a normal thing. The MC understands that appealing means deciding the winner and the loser through a battle. However, if the war is completely impossible to win because of the sheer difference in power, each force is allowed to send a representative, and the winner gets decided after a 1v1 sword battle. This is how a proxy battle goes, which means our boy will represent himself. While there is a high chance that the representative of the plaintiff is going to be Axion, Julius understands that if this goes on, it is guaranteed that the MC will lose. He questions if Theo has a plan in mind, and thinks that if our boy believes someone will step up to be his representative, he will be disappointed. Theo requests to have a proxy battle in a week, just as the rules say. Ed thinks he can see through our boy's plan and understands that he is planning on having Julius or Evelyn as his representative, but no one is going to agree with him, so he will have to fight personally. Ed decides to send Axion as his representative to make the MC understand his place by finishing him off. Ed decides to announce his representative, but suddenly all of them hear someone and become completely speechless. Someone walks in and praises Theo's clever plans as he observes that our boy has changed a lot since he last saw him. He is the clan head, Kyle Ragnar. As soon as he enters the trial room, everyone bows down to show their respects, and the MC also gets on his knees and greets the incarnation of the great dragon god. Suddenly, the system window opens up, telling him to complete a new quest to take over the Camellia Palace and uncover its hidden secrets. He notices it's his first quest after the tutorial and questions if this is related to the blue light he saw earlier. The MC realizes he completely forgot about it because of what's been happening lately and remembers that there was something there. He stops contemplating and decides to focus on the present as he faces his father. He needs to take care of the situation first since the king himself appeared, which is an insane variable that can jeopardize his plan. The MC asks the reason his father is here. Kyle tells him to stand up and says he heard about the whole situation and understands that his son is trying to make an appeal through a proxy battle. Theo responds positively, and his father says he recognizes it's going to be difficult for his son to enter the battle himself and questions who Theo is planning on choosing as his representative for the proxy battle. Our boy realizes his father is trying to test him and says there is no one who can stand in his place, so he is naturally thinking about stepping up himself and being his own representative for the appeal. His father believes his son will lose, but Theo thinks he shouldn't come to such a conclusion without even letting him try. The MC becomes determined to face his challenges and not bend against anyone willingly. After hearing all of this, the king bursts out in laughter and asks the other members of the trial if they heard what his son is talking about. The king becomes impressed by our boy not lowering himself against anyone and recognizes that this is the best way to describe the Ragnars. The king praises his son for such an amazing attitude. Our boy feels grateful and starts to smile as everything is going according to his plan. He remembers the proxy battle is just bait, and since he doesn't have to fight, he feels amazing to say such words without holding back. He remembers the work he requested from his friends Remy and Evelyn, and understands that he will get his hands on the proof of Camellia Palace's treasonous conspiracy, which will make his victory absolute without even fighting. The king decides to give his son an opportunity, and as the master of Ragnar, Kyle says he wishes to test a single strike against our boy. Theo becomes shocked as his father tells him to forget about the trial. He says if the MC can endure a single blow, he will clear all the charges without punishment. The king tells Theo to come out, but Ed starts shouting as he tries to object. He thinks that testing a single strike against our boy means the king approves of him, which means that if, by any chance, Theo is able to endure the single strike, he will receive the approval of the clan head himself. Ed is sure the MC won't be able to endure it, but just in case he somehow does, Ed decides to object and tries to stop the MC from looking favorable in the eyes of the king. He questions how the vassals and bannermen dare to comment on the blood of the clan leader's son and continues to talk about the rules of the proxy battle. But Kyle Ragnar tells him to shut up and makes it clear that if a vassal dares to speak against the Ragnars, they need to just get rid of him. Ed has no choice but to follow the clan leader 
and Kyle asks if Julius has anything to say since he has been giggling for a while. The demon dragon says he is just surprised to see the king show interest after such a long time. Kyle Ragnar gets to the point and asks his son if he is willing to do it. Our boy understands that things have taken a huge turn, and even though he was not expecting this, he smiles and decides to accept the challenge. The MC speaks up and tells the clan leader this is too heavy for him, as it is absurd to compare a single strike from the clan leader himself with a proxy war against vassals and bannermen. The king asks if he is trying to refuse, but our MC answers negatively and says he only wishes to have a fair transfer since the trial has become stricter. He demands that his compensation should also be increased with a cheeky smile on his face. Kyle Ragnar asks his wish, and the MC turns around to look towards Ed and says he wants something like Camellia Palace. Observing all of this, Ed is left speechless. Ed becomes frustrated, and Wolfgang calls it complete madness to propose such a deal with the clan leader himself. He thinks he needs to put the bastard in place since agreements are based on the understanding that both parties hold equal standing. Wolfgang assumes the MC will fail because of his arrogance, but to his surprise, the clan leader agrees with our boy. Kyle thinks that if the MC aims to become the successor, he needs to be at least this courageous and bold. The clan leader asks if the Sky Dragon has any objections, but the man assures him everything belongs to his lord Kyle, so he can't dare to comment on his decision. The lord is happy to hear this and orders them to quickly prepare a stage, as he wants to test his son himself. Theo becomes a bit hesitant, and after a while, as he confronts his father Kyle Ragnar, the other vassals stand on the sidelines to observe. Ed is in complete frustration since the trap he set to catch our MC has turned into a stage favoring him. Ed assures himself not to be anxious, as he thinks that even if Theo has gotten stronger now, there is no chance he can withstand even a single strike from the clan leader, a feat not even high-ranking swordsmen can easily accomplish. Ed assumes Theo is going to die here, but our boy sees through his plans and is confident he won't die thanks to the tutorial reward he received. The king notices something about his son has changed, and questions whether he consumed an elixir without anyone noticing. The king believes even an elixir won't help him change this much, but decides not to care since it doesn't matter to him how the MC became so strong. Our boy realizes his father has seen through him easily. Even the nine dragons haven't noticed he took an elixir. The king asks if he is warmed up. Theo answers positively, and his father cheers that normally he uses his great sword. But since our boy doesn't even know how to use mana yet, his father is trying to go easy on him by using a rusty steel sword instead. The clan leader asks if he has any objections. Theo says he doesn't, and the father becomes serious as he decides to begin the fight. An immense aura starts to spread everywhere as the clan leader moves forward, making our boy anxious. Theo observes the immense pressure his father emits with just his fighting spirit alone. The clan leader praises him, surprised that his son is still standing. Theo remains confident since his strength has almost tripled because of the reward he received after clearing the tutorial known as the Experience Elixir. Using the elixir, he was able to gain five levels, and he put all the stats into his strength. With this much strength, he feels true freedom as he leaves the realm of the weak and enters the realm of the extraordinary. The MC is confident he can survive at least a single strike from his father, and as the clan leader throws his attack, everyone becomes speechless while Ed believes the MC will die. Our boy puts all his focus into defending himself and is able to see the attack coming. The huge red beam of light falls to the ground, destroying the whole stage, and after the smoke clears, the clan leader smiles to see that he was able to finally find a decent son as our MC remains standing leaving everyone shocked. Theo proves his innocence through his will and determination. After successfully surviving the strike, the trial concludes, and the system shows that the sudden quest, single strike from Kyle Ragnar, has been successfully finished. Theo receives an inventory and a mysterious blue key as a reward for his achievements. After some time, our boy wakes up while questioning where he is. His mother, Cecilia, becomes happy to see her son wake up and shares that he fainted while standing. She starts to cry while holding his hand as she expresses her feelings about when she found out the clan leader himself challenged our boy. Cecilia becomes concerned and asks if he has any more injuries, assuring him she will immediately call a physician if he has any fractures or dislocations. Theo tells her he is fine but doesn't recognize where he is. Julius comes in and says that by the orders of the clan leader, the Lady of Camellia Palace, Axion, and the Director of Intelligence have all been vacated. Theo becomes happy as he realizes they are inside the Camellia Palace. The system updates him on the situation and shows that he just needs to uncover the secret now. Inside the Camellia Palace's garden, Imel starts creating a fuss, as she doesn't understand why she is being forced to vacate her own property. The servants try to calm her down and start begging her not to create such a fuss. 
Meanwhile, observing all of this, Ed gives an order to Axion to kill Theo Ragnar. Axion shares his plan for the awakening ceremony, but Ed tells him to cut off Theo's head to finish him off for good. Axion observes Ed's eyes, which are burning with intense desire for revenge. After everything settles down at the Camellia Palace, our boy understands that despite everything going against his plan, he achieved far better results than what he was expecting. He managed to obtain the Camellia Palace without using his trump card, and on top of that, he has obtained another authority. He uses the inventory skill and pulls out an item from inside it. The MC munches on the apple and wonders how such things are possible but recognizes it's very useful. Theo pulls out the blue key from his inventory, which he obtained recently, and believes that it is definitely related to something important. As he focuses on a door, the keyhole suddenly lights up. Theo decides to unlock the door, and as he opens it, he is surprised to see a deep tunnel. The system tells him he has discovered a dungeon for the first time, and the experience he gains inside the dungeon will double as a reward. Seeing a cave inside the Camellia Palace, he assumes it is another quest of some kind and decides to clear it since he doesn't want to miss out on any experience. Before he enters, he remembers he shouldn't go inside the dungeon and prepares. After a while, he comes back with his inventory filled with weapons and decides to check the dungeon. As he walks forward, he notices a huge wolf staring at him and recognizes that it is big enough to be a demonic beast. The wolf monster pounces on him, but our boy is able to defend himself with a shield. He notices the wolf is very strong but quickly pushes it back, determined not to lose in a battle of strength. As he confronts the wolf, it charges toward him while screaming. He quickly slashes the wolf with his sword but fails to injure it and realizes its hide is too thick and the wolf is fast, meaning he won't be able to win against it with half-hearted attacks. The MC recognizes it's no ordinary wolf and might even be as strong as a demonic beast. He admits it won't be easy to defeat the wolf, and suddenly the monster tries to use its claws as it charges toward him. He wishes he could replicate the ray of light he observed when facing his father's single strike. He calls it amazing and tries to use the pure white arc on the wolf, but fails to copy his father's move, accepting that it's not going to be this easy. A single strike is an easier way to label a strike that brings certain death. He finally understands that the key to mimicking his father's attack is to put all his strength into a single sword strike. He leaves his shield and thinks about improving his sword skills and the secret sword arts that rely on his speed, taught by Evelyn, as he charges toward the wolf and stabs its eye. The monster starts screaming and takes a step back. Our boy realizes his plan is working and attacks the wolf once again, believing he'll win. Two months later, at the training ground, Eod observes that the number of people is increasing. Sybil agrees with him and thinks they need to change the training grounds. A rumor about the clan leader teaching the young master Theo a single strike has been spreading lately. So many people now want to spar with him. As Sybil is talking about our boy, someone comes from behind and addresses him as a lackey. It is Henry Morris from Plum Blossom Palace. He questions when the incredible young master of theirs is coming, as it has been two months already. Morris is disappointed and says he assumed the young master never missed a day of training. He calls the MC a coward and thinks he ran away after a fake story of his spread too far. Sybil becomes angry, but Henry doesn't stop and thinks the whole rumor might be a total lie since there were no witnesses. He assumes our boy exaggerated it. Henry assumes the scared dragon society being destroyed must also be fake news. But Sybil's patience runs out, and he punches Henry with all his might, completely destroying his face. Another guy from the Plum Palace becomes angry and insults Sybil, calling him a dropout, but everyone in the training ground starts glaring at him. Sybil calls him a shit face while making it clear that no one can compare to their young master. Eod is surprised to see his friend call someone ugly with such a face. Sybil shares that he was already annoyed to see the guys from Plum Palace who kept coming here to cause trouble and makes it clear he won't let anyone disrespect their young master Theo. Sybil and his comrades pull out their swords and declare war on the guys from Plum Palace. They also become determined to put the dropout losers in their place, but as they are about to fight, someone comes between them and freezes all of their weapons instantly. Everyone is surprised, and Sybil recognizes it is Ray Ragnar from the Four Hounds. Someone also joins in on the fun and starts laughing. It is Hulkus Lanka of the Four Hounds. Sybil is surprised to see two members of the Four Hounds suddenly appear, and Hulkus notices someone is missing. Hulkus asks one of the Plum Palace guys where the Luster Tiger is, which confuses him. Hulkus becomes fired up and questions if everyone is deaf, as he is asking for the master of the training ground. Hulkus announces that he is here to challenge our MC, Theo Ragnar. Meanwhile, inside the dungeon, the MC reaches his limits, and his sword shatters as well. The system notifies him that he has leveled up. Suddenly, multiple system windows start to pop up, showing that his stats are increasing, and he has hunted 170 demonic beasts. 
Our boy sits on the corpses of the monsters he has defeated, and the system shows that only one monster is now left. Theo drinks a healing potion to restore his strength and remembers that he almost died multiple times, but the healing potion always saved him. At first, it was difficult for him to defeat the monsters, but as he leveled up, things became easier. He is still surprised to see how fast time flew by. He has already spent two months inside the dungeon. The system shows him that only one demonic beast is left. He realizes that it's definitely a boss monster as he notices some stairs. The MC starts walking forward and enters the fifth floor. He looks at his broken sword and realizes it won't be usable, so he decides to enable his inventory and pull out another one. He finds only one sword and realizes it's his last one. Our boy remembers he received this sword from his mother as a birthday present. The MC recalls his past life. He had a lot of friction with his mother leading up to the awakening ceremony, so he decided to toss the sword away in his room and let it go to waste. He observes the ceremonial sword and realizes it's a good one forged from white snow steel. Theo becomes silent as he remembers his past life. His mother barged into his room wishing him a happy birthday and shared that she was waiting for midnight to shower him with gifts. But he became angry at her and told her he didn't want to waste his time on birthday presents as the ceremony was near. He was expecting better from his mother and made it clear that no good equipment would ever change his bloodline. He remembers asking his mother to leave him alone, but decides he won't repeat any mistakes from his previous life. Our boy finds the boss room, and the system warns him to be cautious as a strong demonic beast is going to appear soon. Inside the boss room, Theo finds a dragon taking a nap. He becomes relieved to see that it's just a lesser drake. Theo starts to question why the final boss of the quest is draconic. The Ragnars are said to be the descendants of dragons. Our boy wonders if it is merely a coincidence but decides to focus on defeating the boss monster as he can't get out of the dungeon without it. The system shows him the quest scenario and the number of monsters remaining. She questions if he can actually win this battle since he is still facing a kind of dragon. The MC starts focusing and decides to use a single flash. He remembers practicing it a lot against the wolves he faced, and even though it might not be on the same level as his father's dragon flash, he charges toward the dragon, believing that if he utilizes his dragon heart to the maximum, he should be able to land a serious hit. He pierces his sword through the monster's eye and successfully wounds it as the monster starts screaming in pain. Suddenly, it attacks our boy with its tail, but he is able to dodge easily and becomes disappointed that his weak attack was not able to pierce through its brain. The drake starts screaming and gets ready to kill our boy, but he is able to see possibilities and confidently charges toward the drake, believing he might be able to win. The MC lands a few hits and decides to distract the monster first with normal attacks so he can look for its weak point. All of a sudden, the lesser drake starts screaming again and fear begins to dominate the battlefield. Theo's body completely freezes because of fear, and despite being able to see an attack coming his way, he is unable to dodge but blocks it with his sword. He gets thrown away and hits the rock wall, realizing how strong the boss monster is. He admits he can't keep this up for too long and gets up to attack the huge monster coming his way while hoping he can hit its weak points for a quick win. Our boy already knows a dragon's weak point is its reverse scales and jumps onto the lesser drake's body while dodging all attacks. He is able to pierce the reverse scales with his sword and blood starts gushing out of the monster. He keeps hitting the spot as it starts screaming in pain. Our boy believes his plan worked, but the lesser drake doesn't fall down and surprises Theo. At the training grounds, Hulkus gets mad at Rey and makes it clear that he wants to fight the young master first. She calls him a loser and tells him to stay out of it, but he starts defending himself and says he lost three years ago. He has worked hard to improve his skills every day, so three years are more than enough to close the gap. Rey doesn't listen to any of his words and calls him a loser again, which makes Hulkus angrier. He decides to have a duel with her and mentions that the winner will get a chance to fight Theo Ragnar. He hits her with a huge weapon, but she is easily able to stop his attack without being phased. Sybil and Henry don't understand what's happening, but become scared seeing the four Hounds members fight. As they both move forward to attack, Remington appears between them and tells them to go elsewhere since this is the domain of the young Master Theo. He makes it clear that he won't allow anyone to cause trouble for the Master. Hulkus becomes happy to see Remington and shares his desire to fight him as well, but Remington asks Hulkus to understand his words. Suddenly, all of them start to feel an immense pressure, and Remington questions the source of this menacing killing intent. All of them look back to see the MC enter the training grounds. Remington is surprised to feel such overwhelming pressure and starts to wonder what happened during Theo's seclusion training. Ray and Hulkus become excited to see that the young master Theo has finally arrived. Our MC dominates the whole training ground with the skill Lesser Drake's Fear. Earlier inside the dungeon, after the MC pierced through its reverse scales, 
The lesser drake finally died, and the system congratulated our boy on hunting it. As soon as he touched its reverse scales, the monster started going crazy. Our boy thought he would die, but the monster wore itself out after a few minutes since the scales were definitely its weak point. The system notified him that he had obtained the lesser drake's tooth and claw. The tooth was an enhancement material for weapons, while the claw could be used to increase a weapon's sharpness. He decided to use his rewards to fix the sword he had since he didn't want to lose a gift his mother gave him. The MC also received a skill called Lesser Drake's Fear, which surprised him. He read the stats and realized the skill could inflict fear on a target weaker than him. He was shocked to receive such a skill, as he believed only a few chosen ones could use it. He's happy to see he is getting a chance to try it, and while putting all his stuff back in inventory, he questions whether the skill will be useful for him in Ragnar, since the place is already swarming with powerful people. The Camellia Palace dungeon gets cleared, and our boy finally gets out after finishing the quest of uncovering the palace's secrets. For successfully clearing Scenario Quest 1, he receives a nest compass as his reward. He doesn't understand what it is, and questions whether it's going to be useful in the next quest. Theo puts it in his inventory and decides to go rest in his room first since he's completely exhausted. But suddenly, a maid rushes towards our boy and informs him that he needs to take care of an urgent matter. She notices the wounds on his body, but he brushes it off and asks about the issue. The maid informs him that there's a brawl happening in Training Ground 4. Our boy enters the training ground after hearing this, dominating everyone with his new skill, Lesser Drake's Fear. He angrily tells everyone to get lost since he needs rest. The immense aura knocks people unconscious, but Hulkus becomes excited to see such overwhelming killing intent and charges toward our boy without a second thought, to see who is stronger. Hulkus attacks with his sword, but the MC easily overpowers him with just one swing, leaving everyone shocked. Hulkus gets knocked back and cannot believe his strike was deflected so easily. The MC is surprised by his progress after dungeon training, but Hulkus doesn't back down. He has always been considered the weakest member of the Four Hounds of the North because he is very dumb, and never rounds out his arsenal either. Hulkus attacks Theo again, challenging him to block it. Despite being the weakest, Hulkus has never once been outmatched in terms of raw strength, but now the MC is surprised to see that he is able to keep up with Hulkus, and with a single slash, he counters Hulkus and defeats him. He feels amazing after leveling up so much, and Hulkus starts coughing up blood, loses consciousness, and falls down. Theo realizes he was too careless and should have held back but feels glad he was facing Hulkus, who is known for his toughness and can tank such attacks. The MC notices Hulkus only fainted. Sybil becomes surprised, and everyone in the training ground starts cheering for the young master who easily defeated the black bear, one of the four hounds, with a single strike. Theo assures them Hulkus is still alive. Suddenly, his sword breaks as well, which disappoints our boy since it was a gift from his mother. Everyone keeps cheering for the MC, and they all praise him for breaking his sword with a single strike. He doesn't understand why they are so happy. Meanwhile, observing all of this, Ray remembers one of her past memories. When she was a little kid one day, the MC found her and questioned why she was walking around in such cold weather while wearing barely anything. Theo gave Ray his own scarf and thought she still looked really cold, so he decided to take her to his house and told her he would take her home once the snow finally stopped. After recalling all of this, she starts smiling and leaves the battleground. Remington is surprised to see her smile. After a while at the Camellia Palace, our boy looks embarrassed as the maids congratulate him on getting a new title, Luster Tiger. One of the maids is happy to see his hard work finally paying off and advises him to keep it up and maintain the momentum until the awakening ceremony. She believes he can do it, and suddenly, his mother appears and starts feeding him the new abalone dish forcefully. He tries to stop her, but she starts stuffing his face with more food as he begs her to stop. While eating, he remembers his past life and starts to feel grateful. He tells his mother the food is very delicious, and she notices the broken sword. She becomes shocked, and the MC starts sweating anxiously. He tells her it broke during his training and starts apologizing since it is a precious gift she gave him on his birthday. Theo's mother becomes angry at the person who swore it wouldn't break, as it was made with white snow steel and ebony steel wood. He asks if she is talking about the steel wood from the southern jungle. She answers positively and tells him it is a rare and precious material, but feels disappointed to see it was all a lie. She thinks that if the guy was telling the truth, the sword wouldn't break so easily. The MC realizes how precious the materials are, and becomes surprised since he was not expecting it to be so valuable. He wonders how his mother found such a sword. She decides to go ask the maker for some explanation and force him to make a better sword this time that is perfect for her precious son. 
He assures her it's fine and that he can just use another sword. But she rejects the idea and tells him people are finally coming to see his true powers, so he needs to be even more careful than before. Since the awakening ceremony is really close, she says she won't allow him to attend the ceremony while carrying a shabby old sword. Theo is happy to see his mother care so much about him, and Cecilia decides they should get going since they are done talking. The MC is confused. She reveals that they are going to the best workshop in all of Winterra, known as the Basque Workshop. Basque Workshop is one of the top three manufacturing workshops of Winterra, and its fame comes from the sheer size that rivals a factory. However, the most notable thing about the workshop is its master. She is a person who falls into the category of special rank by the intelligence agency, and a blacksmith with the title of Master Craftsman, which only two other Ragnar artisans hold. The MC is surprised to see the elf of capitalism incarnate, the demon craftsman Kursen. He never expected to meet such a tycoon and questions how his mother has connections with the demon craftsman. Cecilia angrily questions why her mother is still smoking. Hearing her call Kursen her mother, our boy becomes speechless. Kursen tells Cecilia not to address her as mother since their relationship is not that of a parent and child. On the day Cecilia decided to run away, Theo was told his mother is an orphan with no family in the world, but is surprised to see she is the daughter of the high elf Kursen. He realizes that the reason he looks so handsome is that he is also a quarter elf. Kursen asks why Cecilia unexpectedly decided to visit her. Theo's mom throws back the sword and tells her it is a defective product. Kursen doesn't believe her and becomes mad hearing her daughter call it a defective sword, even though she forged it herself. Kursen pulls out the sword and realizes it's broken. Cecilia questions if that's not a defective product, and Kursen becomes speechless. The High Elf asks who the wielder is. Cecilia tells her Theo is the wielder of the sword. Kursen asks if it's the kid behind her, and she tells her mother to watch her mouth because the MC is a genius who will one day reign over Ragnar from here on. Theo introduces himself to the High Elf and expresses his gratitude for being able to see the renowned Master of Basque workshop. Kursen remembers him and praises Cecilia for raising such a child. Kursen asks if he is the only one who used the sword, and the MC answers positively. Cecilia thinks the sword is defective, but Kursen becomes surprised and realizes it's going to be a long conversation, so she invites them inside. As they all walk in, the MC asks if his mother is related to the demon craftsman. She says he is right, and he becomes curious if Kursen is her real mother. Cecilia tells him he wouldn't know since she didn't speak much about it, but even though it was for a short period, Kursen took her in as a foster mother. Cecilia shares that her mother loves anything she finds beautiful, whether it is music, jewels, theater, or even people. She says that is the reason Kursen took her in as a foster child. Kursen tells them to stop talking about the past, calling it pointless. Cecilia thinks she is lying, and her son asks how she ended up getting out of this place. Kursen reveals that Cecilia left because of her desire to marry the Ragnar clan's leader. Kursen never expected her daughter to willingly go to such a miserable place and is surprised she has survived for so long. Cecilia says she couldn't resist the manliness and handsomeness of the clan leader, who loved her dearly. Kursen is disappointed that despite running away from home, she came back last year and started begging Kursen to forge a sword to gift Theo. Kursen calls her shameless, but Cecilia becomes annoyed to hear her say such things in front of her son. They both start arguing, and the MC smiles, as he has never seen his mother talk like this. He remembers that in his past life, he never tried to learn anything about his mother, and was an extremely ungrateful son. He questions if he was just too obsessed with the clan, and notices that Kursen cares a lot about his mother as well. He wonders why she didn't do anything in his past life. They finally reach their destination, and Kursen shares that this is the room she lives in. Cecilia asks why her mother brought them so far inside, and demands her to make the best sword for Theo to make up for it. Kursen suddenly tells Cecilia to wait outside as she grabs Theo and quickly closes the door, leaving Cecilia outside. Inside her room, Kursen completely ignores Cecilia calling her and decides to get straight to the point. She asks if the MC has the relic of the primordial dragon. Our boy becomes confused and questions if she is talking about the ancestor of the guardian dragon that protects the clan. He shares that he has heard about the legend that treasure has been distributed across Wintera for the descendants of the Ragnar clan. She makes it clear that it's not a legend and questions if he really doesn't have any relic. Kursen starts to tear up and becomes frustrated, wondering how he was able to destroy her sword, even though she poured her heart and soul into forging it. She doesn't believe the sword can break against anything other than a relic and questions if our boy has any idea how precious the sword was. He tries to apologize and remembers that the sword got damaged while he was fighting a lesser drake. 
He doesn't understand anything about relics, but she gives up and decides to show him instead so he can understand faster. She shows him a casket that's completely sealed with chains and asks if he notices something. The MC starts to see the blue glow and questions if it is a quest after recognizing it as the same glow he saw from the door of the dungeon in the palace. Kirsten shares that she doesn't see anything but believes he was able to notice something judging from his actions. She starts dragging the casket and tells him she has tried many times to open the sealed casket and obtain the item inside, but she always fails. She puts down the shield casket and mentions the primordial dragon's relic. Kirsten shares a story of the primordial dragon that removed one of its fangs and forged a blade from it, known as the Monster Sword White Moonlight Blade. She tells him that if he tries to break the seal on the casket and is successful, she will hand him the sword known as the White Moonlight Blade. The MC looks a bit confused, and she reveals that if he fails to open it, he might lose his life in the process. She questions if he still wants to try it, and the MC starts smiling out of excitement. He makes it clear that the sword is now his. The system shows that the next scenario for the quest is to be chosen by the primordial dragon's relic, the White Moonlight Blade. The White Moonlight Blade is a sword of the leader of Black Snow, who is one of the nine dragons known as the Black Dragon. Very few people know about the sword because everyone who has ever seen or talked about it has either died or gone missing. Our boy remembers a mysterious man who noticed him and was surprised he was visible to Theo. The MC ended up seeing the true form of the sword through sheer coincidence and doesn't understand why the Black Dragon let him live. He is surprised to find out that the Black Dragon's White Moonlight Sword is here, and it is an actual relic of the Primordial Dragon. He remembers running into the Black Dragon four years ago and realizes Kirsten was in possession of the sword during that time. She asks if he wants to open it, and the MC starts smiling, becoming determined to obtain the sword no matter what. He tells her it's his sword now, and while observing the casket, he realizes it's very similar to the Camellia Palace. He tries to use the blue key to open the casket. Kirsten is confused as our boy unlocks the gasket, and a weird light starts to shine. Suddenly, Kirsten becomes concerned as our boy starts getting pulled inside by a mysterious black fog. The MC tries to free himself but fails and gets dragged into a mysterious place. He opens his eyes and doesn't understand where he is. Theo recognizes the Rose Palace while everything is engulfed in fire. He doesn't understand why he is seeing all of this again. And while watching his past memories, he realizes he completely forgot how weak he used to be. Because of this, he needs more power, enough to defeat Randone and crush the Camellia Palace. A griffin starts messing with his brain and grabs our boy, ready to eat him whole, but the MC wakes up and grabs its beak, catching it off guard. He becomes aware that the monster is trying to take over his mind by using his desire for power against him. The MC realizes this is why it is called a monster sword. The mysterious griffin calls him insolent and tries to free itself but the boy confidently tells it he has already conquered all the despair it's trying to show him a long time ago. He questions if the monster was hoping he would be tempted by its useless powers, even though he has already seen many quests. The griffin becomes confused, and our MC notices it looks very different from the griffin in his memory. The monster tries to free itself, but our boy doesn't let go and remembers it was at least 10 meters tall, but right now they are both of similar heights. He questions if the griffin became smaller because it was seen for a long time. He decides not to care about it, and makes it clear that the Moonlight Sword is now his as he tries to punch the griffin with an evil look. The monster tries to talk it out with him. Meanwhile, inside Kirsten's room, Cecilia starts screaming after seeing her son knocked unconscious. She tries to wake him up, but nothing works, and Cecilia starts crying as she questions her mother why her son is unconscious like this. Kirsten becomes speechless as Cecilia cries and says she never asked her mother to do this. She just wanted a sword for her son. Kirsten observes that there is a monster's energy linked with Theo's bloodstream, which is something she has never seen or heard about before. She was hoping he would be okay since he already possessed a relic. Cecilia tells her mother that if anything bad happens to her son, she will never forgive Kirsten for her actions. All of a sudden, the MC grabs the Moonlight Sword, and a mysterious light starts to form around his chest. Cecilia becomes concerned and tries to wake him up. Theo finally opens his eyes. She hugs her son tightly as she starts to cry. She tells her son she was very worried, but he assures her not to overthink it as he is completely okay. The system congratulates him on hunting a griffin and finishing the quest. As a reward, he becomes the owner of the White Moonlight Sword. The MC understands that he survived because of his luck. The griffin was easily defeatable because it was just freshly unsealed, and any psychological attacks were of no effect on him. The system notifies him that he has observed the monster energy of the White Moonlight Sword, so now his magic power has greatly increased. His magic power surpasses 200, and his body starts glowing. 
Our boy learns that his magic power has started to gain divinity and has increased to the level of a high-ranking swordsman. He feels disappointed to know he can't use the magic power right away as he needs to hold himself back until the awakening ceremony. Kirsten expresses how surprised she was and congratulates him on succeeding. He questions if she is going to keep her promise, and she assures him that elves do not lie. He notices the sword is being rebellious and questions if the sword still hasn't acknowledged him as its master. He becomes a bit anxious, but the elf assures him the sword is acting this way after being trapped for 400 years. She says since the sword is finally out in the world, it wants to release all the pent-up frustration. Kirsten suggests he can try taking a swing at the wall with all he has. He questions if it will be okay, but she starts mocking him and thinks he is worrying for no reason because, even if it is the legendary sword, a swing from a brat like him who is inexperienced and hasn't even had his awakening ceremony can't damage the Basque workshop. He becomes unnerved to hear this and decides to give it a try. Our boy understands that he can hide his dragon heart whenever he wants, so this is a nice opportunity for him to test out the new legendary sword he just received. He walks toward the wall and tries using all of his magic power. The MC excuses himself and removes the cover of the legendary moonlight sword as he gets ready to take a swing. Kirsten observes him and becomes concerned. She tries to stop our boy, but he ends up using an attack known as Single Flash, completely destroying the workshop's wall. Cecilia becomes astonished while Kirsten's eyes fill with anxious tears at the sight of the destruction. Contrary to what Kirsten thought, my guy literally split the building wall in half with just one swing of his sword, and he was not even aiming to destroy the wall. Kirsten couldn't help but sink into despair at yet another costly loss from our boy, especially after the sword he had just broken. Even Theo thinks this is seriously overkill, and he's already running on empty because that sword drained all his magic to pull off that devastating slash. Right at that moment, Kirsten starts giving him some mana, and she dashed towards him so quickly that he didn't even notice when she reached him. She's startled to see he really has no control over his magic at all. Whatever the case, after looking at this massive crack in the ten-foot-thick wall, she's sure this lad is an absolute genius. She starts to feel kind of proud to have a grandson like him, and I can see those dollar signs in her eyes which clearly show that her greedy mind is cooking up something juicy to profit off our boy. She puts her hand on him and tells him she'll be his patron from now on, and all he has to do is spread his wings and show the world his skills. Well, there you go. She's literally using him as a walking, talking billboard for her workshop, and Theo can clearly see the glint in her eyes. He bluntly tells her he can see those dollar signs shining right back at him. As the night deepens, Theo and his mother prepare to leave Basque's workshop. After exchanging their last goodbyes, they part ways. We see the fangs she's holding, and it turns out Theo gave them to her as wall repair funds. She's thrilled to have this loot from a drake, and is sure he must have snagged it while obtaining the relic. She's also feeling proud of her daughter, thinking about how she raised such an incredible son. Right at that moment, someone drops by and greets her with her title of Demon Craftsman. Kirsten freezes for a moment at the sound of this familiar voice. She turns around and asks why he's here, but this mysterious crow of Robur Ragnar just simmers with a red glint in his eyes and doesn't say a word leaving us hanging in suspense. Five days pass, and the day of the awakening ceremony has finally arrived. As usual, Evelyn and Theo are in the middle of a sparring session. After exchanging blows with him, she can tell that his swordplay has gotten stronger and faster overall. My guy just flashes a grin, saying he's really glad to hear this because he never thought someone like Evelyn would ever praise him. The onlookers, as usual, are sweating their balls because they feel like weak sauce compared to Theo. You see, it's been half a year since Theo began to change and Evelyn is amazed that he's already grown strong enough to push her back. If he awakens his magic today, it'll be the birth of a monster. After they spar for a while, the lady gives him props, saying he's done a great job, and that he might even aim to become the valedictorian of the awakening ceremony, and her prayers are with him. Theo flashes a big smirk back at her, thanking her for her kind words. He says that if he becomes valedictorian, he'll mention her name during his speech in front of everyone. Of course, Evelyn gives him this worn-out look, wondering if that's even necessary, while his fellows come over, excitedly telling him to mention their names too. Theo couldn't help but feel a bit proud, thinking that being popular is such a drag, while Evelyn just gave him this creeped out look, clearly thinking how he is getting way too full of himself. The scene then transitions to the central headquarters, where Theo makes his grand entrance, introducing himself to the guards as Theo Ragnar of Camellia Palace. Once inside, he notices the large crowd in attendance, as the awakening ceremony is the most important annual event for the Ragnar clan. Every participant is hoping to get good results, and as swordsmen of Ragnar, this is their first chance to be acknowledged and honored. With everyone from the Ragnar clan watching, including the clan head, Kyle Ragnar, the pressure is high. 
Even some big shots are present, like the Nine Dragons and the former clan head from two generations ago, Hilda Ragnar. The more Theo looks at Hilda, the less she seems like someone who's 150 years old. Either way, he is relieved to see her attending again. The conductor then bangs a drum to grab everyone's attention. This guy is Vanna Ragnar, the judge of the ceremony, and a Dragon Gate swordsman. He snaps everyone to attention and tells them it's time to begin the preliminary examination. The prelim involves grabbing a sword placed on the ground and leaving a mark on the steel wall on the platform. He reveals that the wall is forged with a mix of white snow steel, so ordinary steel blades won't even scratch it, but that changes if they channel their magic power into their attacks. To help with that, he decides to hand out Soma to everyone. This single Soma pill will provide the power of ten years' worth of magic, an elixir designed to help open their mana halls. He tells them to swallow the Soma and focus on opening their mana hall in the Dantian, and only then will they be able to cut through the white snow steel wall with their swords. The depth of their cut will determine their results. Vahana screams out that from now on, the participants whose names he calls will have to step forward, grab a Soma, and get on the platform. The first participant is Theo Ragnar, and they tell him to come forth. Of course, my guy steps forward promptly, and as he's taking that pill, he reflects on how, in his past life, Axion was the valedictorian. He then grabs a sword and walks toward the white wall, determined that this time won't be like the past. As he does, a system window pops up with Scenario Quest 3, become the valedictorian of the awakening ceremony to clear the quest. We then cut to the 150-year-old Hilda, asking Kyle if this boy is the one he mentioned before. Kyle responds positively, and asks if he has caught her attention too. Hilda replies that she's definitely curious after hearing so much about this boy and wants to see for herself just how competent his descendant really is. My guy stretches his shoulder muscles, while he can't help but to feel nervous. The judge, Vanna, promptly appears and reminds him to swallow the Soma. Theo promptly pops the pill into his mouth, reflecting on how in his past life he had swallowed the Soma but was unable to control the mana, seriously injuring his Dantian. But this time, something like that won't happen. As soon as he swallows the pill, he feels a surge of power, and the mana begins to scatter around the area. Vana finds himself bewildered to see this brat causing a mana wave of this size. He's worried Theo might not be able to properly control it. You see, when someone swallows Soma, they need to handle it with care. In order for the mana hall to settle in the Dantian, the more talented Ragnars, who have loads of mana, need to be extra cautious. If not, they can end up disabled, and Vana is certain this brat is done for. But, as surprising as it is, my guy quickly stabilizes. Theo couldn't help but feel a rush of happiness realizing he has both a dragon heart and a mana hall. It's almost a bit disheartening how easy it feels this time, unlike in his past life. But anyway, from now on, he's officially allowed to use mana, and he won't have to hold back the vast amount stored in his dragon heart. He prepares himself, leaps into the air, and just unleashes everything. A dragon manifests from his mana, soaring straight toward the wall. In a single flash, it hits the wall, creating a giant crack. Vana is left absolutely boggled, and he announces without a doubt that Theo Ragnar has passed. The spectators are equally bamboozled by such a display of power. A system window promptly pops up before Theo, announcing that the curse of bad luck that's been in effect has ended, and his fame is beginning to spread throughout the world. A genuine joy spreads across our boy's face because he's finally reached the same starting point as the others. The system further reveals that many people have taken an interest in his impressive performance. Osa Ragnar Plunus wishes to take him in as a disciple, while Julius Ragnar is discontent with the amount of attention focused on him. Meanwhile, Rober Ragnar remains cautious about him. And lastly, Hilda Ragnar shows interest as well. My guy is thrilled that not only the Black Dragon and the Sword Dragon are paying attention to him, but the fact that he's also caught Hilda's eye makes him especially happy. After all, she has the heart of Garuda. He thinks to himself how amazing it would be if he could just obtain that. The other contestants also try their luck with the White Wall. One of them manages to leave only a tiny scratch, as thin as a hair. He cries out to see that he has a long way to go to even come closer to Master Theo. Ray Ragnar gives it a shot, and so does Hulkus Lanka and Remington Nacrio. They all do their best, but none come anywhere close to the massive cut my guy left in the wall. This poor guy is absolutely devastated that all four Hounds of the North had monstrous results, yet not a single one of them made a mark as great as the young Master Theo. It's finally Axion Ragnar's turn, and as he walks forward, people start murmuring among themselves. Some say that at this rate it's a contest between the Luster Tiger and the Dark Tiger, while others doubt even Axion can match that level. The fact that people are talking about Theo like this only angers Axion beyond belief. He strides toward the wall with his sword in hand, and once he swallows the Soma pill, he's fired up. The mana crackles around him, and out pops a giant red dragon that slashes directly at the wall. 
The sheer power of it leaves Vana utterly speechless because this is the first time he's been surprised so many times in one day. The crack in the wall is massive, and Vana promptly announces that Axion Ragnar has passed as well. The crowd goes absolutely bonkers because Axion's slash has left a crack just as big as Theo's. Now everyone is on edge, knowing that the precision grading will be the deciding factor in who comes out on top. As dusk begins to settle in, Vana announces that with this, the first stage of the awakening ceremony is officially over. This year, he's particularly satisfied to see so many people significantly increase their scores. He says that those who passed should prepare for the second stage of the awakening ceremony in four days. Finally, the rankings that everyone has been waiting for will be announced, including the valedictorian for the first stage of the awakening ceremony.